Hello, my name is Raji Priyadarshi and I'm from PR3 Systems. Today we are going to talk about IBM Information Server installation. IBM Information Server installation seems very simple, but there are a lot of decisions that you need to make. And if you do not make the right decision, you might have problems immediately after the install or maybe down the line. So what we are going to talk about are some of the important concepts and some of the important considerations that have to be thought about before we do the install. So number one is sizing. We need to know exactly how many CPUs you need, what should be the CPU size, the CPU speed, how much of disk space you need, what kind of memory you need. A lot of these questions have to be answered before you do the install. But how do you decide what does the CPU speed require, what kind of space do you need? So there has to be a process. So within PR3 systems, we have got a proprietary process called the PIC solution. In PIC solution, we talk about all the different components which are involved in the decision process. The PIC solution stands for Product Installation, Configuration and Knowledge Transfer. PIC solution helps you to install and configure information server properly designed for your unique system. So we'll not talk a lot about PIC system, but even if you do not hire us, if you wanna just do it on your own, how do you go about installing information server? So as I said, the first exercise is sizing. So number one consideration when you are looking for sizing is what kind of volume of data that you are looking for currently. What is the exact volume that you're processing from a data perspective? And not only that, if you want your system to be scalable, reusable, and extendable, you also need to put yourself in the future and think about the data volume that you might be requiring in future. So once you have looked at the data volume, the second thing that you need to look at is what are the critical time frames for data processing within your environment? So within a 24 hour period, are there some hours which are very, very critical from a processing standpoint? Many of our clients, they have got windows, like one hour window in which the processing has to be complete, otherwise they'll tend to lose a million dollars. So what are those considerations within your organization that needs to be considered? And you have to make sure that to meet those tight deadlines and critical performance requirements, you are equipped with the right kind of CPU, the right kind of architecture, the right kind of configuration. So once we have looked at the sizing, the second aspect is what is called the security architecture. Now, what do I mean by security architecture? Many times when you're dealing with data, you're dealing with a lot of sensitive information. You have to make sure that the right person has got the right authority to run the processes, to modify the data, to view the data. And there's a fully configured security infrastructure that you need to have. So how do you implement security authentication and authorization? You can do it a a different the different sets of options that you have a lot of organizations nowadays they want to have a, a a separate security infrastructure for authentication and authorization they might be using LDAP Active Directory there are different options and the information server has to work with them so that there's a single repository for user ID and password that the information server can authenticate from Similarly, there's one place where you set the authorization within LDAP. Once you have the authorization set within LDAP, there are some additional authorization that you can set within the information server. And once you have got all the authorizations properly set, then only you can be sure that 
the only the right person would have access to the right data at the right time. Now, once we have looked at the security architecture, then the third aspect that we need to look at is what exactly is your software landscape or the hardware landscape? What are the systems that you're going to talk to from a source perspective, from a target perspective? What kind of file systems are you going to be talking to? Are you going to read flat files? Are you going to read comma separated files? Are you going to read XML? What exactly are you going to do? Are you going to do just batch processing? Or do you have needs for real-time processing where customer can just send a request, you have to process data. Once you get the request, you do the processing and you send the response to the caller. So there are a lot of different options and considerations. And last but not the least is the tier architecture. IBM Information Server is very flexible. There are a lot of different options that you can use, but there are consequences. So just because something is available, that does not mean that you should always use it. So you have to use your own analysis before you decide on an infrastructure or, or, or a tier architecture. So I'll just go a little deep into this. So for example, if I'm doing an install for one of my clients, I've got multiple tiers. There, there, is, a, there is a four tier system that we need to configure and install. So the first tier is the client tier, which I'm not going to talk about. I'm just going to talk about the three tiers on the server side. So the first tier is the engine, the engine tier. And the second is the services tier. And third is the repository. So the engine tier has got all the engines, the data stage, server engine, and the parallel engine. And these engines are required for the proper functioning of the data stage processes. The second tier is the services tier, where we have got the application server. It could be a Vsphere application server, or you could also use web logic. There are ways to use web logic in this infrastructure if you already have web logic. Most of the customers do use Websphere. You can either use a brand new install installation of Websphere. When you install information server, it comes with a Websphere, also known as WAS. Or you can also configure an existing Websphere application server to work with your new installation. The third one is the repository. This is also known as a metadata repository. It could be DB2 by default. It could be Oracle. It could be SQL Server. And all of them could be on the same machine or on different machines. Or you could have different combinations. So for example, engine and services could be on one machine. The repository could be on a different machine. Services and repository could be on one machine. So there are multiple different configurations. Now, why is it that there are a lot of options? Because we want to make sure that you have got the flexibility. But how do you decide? They say that when you've got a lot of choices, that means you've got a lot of issues also that can come up. So I'm going to talk about a brief way in which you can look at some of these different options and decide the best option for you. So the Vsphere application server over here in the services and the repository, this is a very chatty communication, which means there's a lot of data flow between these two tiers. The engine and the services, they talk to each other too. And in some cases, the engine also talks to the repository. But this is a primary communication channel. Now what happens is that, suppose you decide, so I'm gonna give you a couple of scenarios. Scenario one is that we have got a customer and the customer has, is using Oracle as the default database. They've got very, they want 
the Oracle to be their database and no other databases can be in the mix because they do not have the skill set and they just don't want to get an additional complexity in your system. So what they decide is that they choose Oracle as a repository, which is fine. Absolutely not a problem because it's it can work very well. And then some other you've got you are they don't have web logic, so they will still be using WebSphere, which comes with information server. Now, since they already have dedicated Oracle database servers, they want the Oracle metadata repository to reside on that server and not on any other servers. So now we have got the WebSphere application server and the repository, these are on two separate machines, which is phen phenomenal in many situations. But in some situations, particularly when you are expecting a lot of volume and a lot of developers who are going to connect to your data stage infrastructure or the information server infrastructure, there might be a problem. Let's see what that problem is. The problem is that this communication, when these are on two separate machines, is it is through TCP IP. Now, every time a developer logs on or just opens any job, you have got a communication from the client to the engine and then engine to the services, and then it goes to the repository. Now, imagine that if you have got around 20 to 30 developers who are trying to connect to your data stage engine through their clients, all of them are going to have connections and data flow with the repository. Now, if it is TCP IP, and if you've got even a little bit of a bandwidth issue, this can be huge problem because suddenly your speed that the developer sees really is, is very slow. So as a result, a great decision can get can result in a very bad result. So these are some of the options. What also can happen is that uh, suppose if your engine and was there on two separate machines, that's fine. I've not seen a lot of issues because this communication communication is not as chatty as this communication. So I'll share with you a story. So the point which I'm trying to say is that which configuration you use, they all can be on one server, in which case the communication between these processes uses shared memory, which is much, much faster. And you can also extend as your volume increases. Or you can have this kind of configuration, which is good, but you might have issues once your number of developers increases. So this is just my opinion. From an architectural standpoint, all of these options are great. I want to share with you a story which really happened a couple of years back and it was a tough time for, for us. Uh, we had a customer and they used this architecture and they had around 120 developers. And the situation became so bad because of this delay in this communication because of bandwidth issues is that when a developer used logged in, it used to take just 20 minutes to open the designer in data stage. So one of the managers who was there, he, he called us and says, uh, told me, Rajiv, you've got a problem and I, we can't do much, but my project is getting delayed. So can you help us by providing one server which can help us to do our development and then we can just complete our development and we should be fine. So I said, okay, I'll try. So I didn't have any servers at that time because uh, they, they needed something very fast. But what I did was I just said, okay, for the timing, let's just, just make, have one simple experiment. So I just used one laptop, installed Linux on it, installed data stage, all the three tiers on that single laptop and configured it and gave it to him. And that laptop was 20 to 30 times faster and all their 10 developers within that project, they were able to use it and they were able to complete the project on time. So that made me really think that if one laptop could be faster than enterprise level servers just because of a bad architecture, is this not a very important consideration? 
So there are good reasons for whatever architecture that you choose, but make sure that you understand the nuances. Because if you're not able to choose the right architecture, you can have problems down the line. We do help our customers. We have got a full methodology. This is called, as I said, the PIC solution, where we talk about product installation, configuration, and knowledge transfer. We make sure that we give you a performance questionnaire in the very beginning. We create the sizing blueprint for you. We give you the hardware configuration. We install, configure, and transfer the knowledge so that once we leave, you can manage and install all the patches in future and you've got everything in house. So if you have any thoughts, uh, any comments, please let us know. Please give your comments below. Uh, please let us know what else we can uh, talk about. We'll be giving videos like this pretty regularly because we want to make sure that we help the community of information server users so that they can have the best installation and uh, best infrastructure which is which can only solve the problems for today but also can position them so that they are able to solve the problems of future thanks again for watching this video look forward to seeing you again on the next video